All right, we're on. So I'll repeat myself one last time. So Unit 5, Establishing Churches in the 21st Century. We're going to deal with three major issues, procedures in establishing churches, implications of operating by one basic plan, and renewal and reform of the 21st century church. Okay, sounds exciting? Maybe not. But the problem is the church isn't what it should be because we're not affecting the world as we ought. Worldwide, God is doing amazing things, but in America, there needs to be reform. If you look at um, the history of the church, we've gone through a ta different times of reformation. The history of the church. And if um, you see from the time of Luther, and even before that, God had began giving revelation to individuals who decided to open up their Bible. And those who opened up the Bible, because originally the, the Catholics basically had the Bible all in Latin, and only a few people could understand it. And they had so much traditions that they couldn't really see the truth and nullify the truth. But eventually, different ones who probably really had a relationship with God began to seek the word for themselves, and in Revelation, God revealed himself and different truth. And with that truth, they began to reform in areas that they saw... Uh, things built not the right way. And so Martin Luther was one of the original people that really began to bring change to the structure of the church. And then we see continually um, there's been, you know, and most denominations were founded with an individual or a group, small group of people who had a revelation of God. The truth was made known and understood to them and they began to teach that truth and, and bring it forth to a people and they began a movement. You know, usually a revival took place in that time. Uh, and the problem with is that many of them, well, all of them pretty much decided that this was the truth that they were going to hold on to and God wasn't going to build on it. And so when somebody else got revelation, they, you know, yeah, and so then the denomination formed, you know, and everybody separated. So God now is desiring the renewal in today's world is to bring all the revelation together as one. The truth as it is, not extremes, not somebody having one truth and that's all they focus in on, so it becomes extreme, goes beyond um, what it was, uh, you know, initially presented to them. You know, so, a lot, you know, a lot of things that we see today, there's some truth in it, but then there's some non-truth. You know, it's like, if I turn on TBN, what I heard 15 years ago when I used to watch TBN, is what I'm basically hearing today. The majority of the speakers are speaking the same kind of message. It usually has to do with prosperity and different things. And when you just focus in on one subject over and over again, you know, it just, you take it, you know, you're trying to, then you're trying to find revelation out of it. You know? So you're using your intellect now to, and that's when it becomes all twisted and, and all that. So, um, Different scriptures that were given were Acts 11. We see the different scriptures, the biblical passages that were given. Um, Acts, 1 Timothy, and Titus. And so I basically just read through those scriptures and um, found the main points. So Paul's mission was to preach the good news. Okay, this is basically how churches are to be established. You go and you preach the good news. Okay? If people like what they hear, they stick around. You know, they become converted. They give their life to the Lord. And then you make disciples. So you preach the good news. And those who respond, you make disciples. And then now after making disciples, you establish a church. And then you strengthen that church. Okay. This could not be done alone. As his team grew, his call expanded. Okay, so elders had to be appointed wherever church in, church began in order for Paul to move on. So Paul would, again, preach the good news, make disciples, establish the church. He would continue to strengthen the church for a time period. And in that time, he would see those who grew and, and began to have the character to be an elder. And then he would appoint them. And then he would move on to do the same thing somewhere else. And then we see he would now continue, though, to stay connected to that church that he planted. Okay, just like a good parent doesn't just leave their kids alone. When they're on their own, you still stay connected. You still stay there to be of help when they're needed, to warn them when you feel is necessary. 
So Paul continued to, as we see throughout the books, the Pauline epistles were all Paul sending letters to those churches to bring correction, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to deal with issues, to add different understanding that they, that they might need. So that was how church was done. Okay, not very complicated. Paul's example is what stirred others on. Our life speaks much louder than mere words. So, that, you know, the one thing that also Paul would write in his letters was what he was going through. You know, that's what, that's what makes us a leader, is if we're going through stuff and people can recognize that the way we're going through something could help them get through it. But nowadays, preachers can't be open, can't be honest, can't be... I know, you know, as we just covered up in ministry, that's how you know, it's like a big secret, and I could only talk to you if you at my level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not even that. biblical. <laughs> that's not even biblical, as we see. How can, how can you? People need to know the life of the individual and how the word is is working in their life, not just preaching. You know, what does that mean if I don't know how to apply it to my life? You're not telling me how that works in somebody's life because you can't tell me about your own life. That's a way to keep from being accountable and to be able to be on the download and do what they want to do. That's why I probably didn't do that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been actually, again, studying my class on nonprofits. It's all dealing with CEOs and how, you know, there's such lack of accountability, you know, and um, how that needs to change, you know, how there needs to be strategies and, and different, you know, outside people that come in and constantly evaluate a CEO, you know, on the board and making sure everybody's doing their job, doing their duty, you know. This is actually in the church, you know, we need to be evaluated. That's why there's a lot of independent churches, you know, independent so you don't have any covering, so nobody has to check you out, you know. And that's the big thing with, a lot, you know, that's, it's good to be a pastor, many people, because you can just get away with things. Some people just enter into it just to get away. You know, when I was on the mission field, I, I knew some of the people were just on the mission field so they could escape from dealing with the stuff that they uh, deal with back at home. It's just a place to escape where they can continue to get away with stuff. You know, it was like living on the island of St. Croix. That was what the island was known for. It was a U.S. island, and people actually, criminals, would go to that island because you could get away with things there that you couldn't get away with here. So some people go to church and become leaders because you can just get away with it because it's such lack of structure, lack of accountability. We just let everything go. Uh, we're just led by the Spirit. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. There is an order that is necessary. You know, we have to understand that we have flesh. And we're all prone to fall in sin. And we can never get out of that. There's never, you know, no matter if you're Pope John Paul, especially if you're not, or Pope, whatever the Pope is named now, Pope Francis, or, uh, and I, I, I just saw a quote, and I, I'd have to research it to say it's true, but that the Pope came out and said that, you know, yeah, all good people basically go to heaven. You don't need to go to heaven through Jesus Christ, so maybe it was, yeah. So, yeah, that's why it's important to research those things. Oh, that was a misquote. Yeah, oh. The artist was in um Oh okay. I think it was Bishop Matera that put that quote out or something. But um Yeah, so So our life needs to speak. That's the only way we're really gonna have true followers. You know, you're not a leader unless you have people following you. But it doesn't mean just because you have a crowd that you have people following you. You know, people follow you only because your life is what they're following. Not just because you you have some great program or because people want to be um, classified with your group. Because it's, you know, like at our church in St. Croix, that was, it, was, it became the in thing to be part of our church. So it doesn't mean people just went there because they were saved and they wanted to grow in God. No, they, just because they could say, I was part of, I'm part of this church, you know. Politicians do thought of things like that a lot. You know, they just do whatever because, you know, that's what, you know, they're just puppets, you know, what the people want. 
So some people just join the church for all kinds of reasons. Doesn't mean that they're really following you, you know. So uh, you know, if we're not open and transparent about our life and can be completely naked and honest, nobody's following us, you know. So uh, that's a very important key about truly being a leader: just being transparent, naked, nothing to hide, open and real. Well, that's a biblical leader. Yeah. Because yeah yep and you know what, what did how did it start in the beginning when Adam was given all dominion and all authority well how was he he was naked and that, you know that's what it means. You know you can walk in authority and dominion when you're naked, when you have nothing to hide, when you're transparent. Yeah. So as soon as shame comes on and you're hiding, then all kinds of you know then you're kicked out of the garden. You kick you know how 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 deep can somebody's relationship go with God when you're hiding? You know you're not you're not in the garden. You're not in Eden. You're not in that place where you can receive from God, so therefore you can't give out God. So uh, accountability is so key. We've got to have people in our life that we can be completely honest and open to who, who will speak to us, who will tell us, you know, I can see. Yeah, they'll tell us the truth. I see right through you. You know, that's why you've got to have, Puerto Ric- you've got to have some Puerto Ricans close to you. <laughs> <laughs> Today, people, um, when they're speaking to each other, coming from a point of Christ view, mm-hmm. instead of being honest and above board, they're telling people what they think they want to hear, as opposed to what Christ wants you to actually tell them. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that's got to speak the truth, man. <laughs> Yeah, live the truth, be the truth, speak the truth. And it comes with a, you know, price. You're going to offend people sometimes. You know, with time and age, you usually grows an understanding of greater grace. You know, and the way you present the truth is usually more loving and kind. You know, when people are young and zealous, and, you know, you hear the truth, and just, you know, tell it as it is, and you still tell it as it is as you're older, but you have an under, you know, a greater because you've lived it out, you've seen, you've been tested. Once you've been tested and tried, you have a whole different approach usually than before that. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially if you're pastorally, pastoral. Um, okay, so our reading, so that was basically the summary of the scriptures, was just basically, um, you know. Stuff and basically review. I think we've hit all those scriptures throughout the course. It was just review of, of, of the procedures in establishing a church. Okay, so anything of doing it any other way? So if the procedure is, well, I've been in a church a long time, the pastor doesn't recognize my gifting, and you know what? There's some issues in the church I don't like. I'm going to go start a church over here. And you know what? I bet I can get some of these people to go with me. Do you think that's a good procedure? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's how it works. Today. Yeah. That's, yeah. Oh, I can. You know, just sit back and see what. Oh, I could see. I could do things differently over here. I bet people. You know, that's you know how businesses run. If you're a good business, you know you kind of uh, scope out your environment, see what's lacking, check out some of the businesses, see what they don't provide, and then you offer something that is missing. You know. So that's how churches are operating, same type of way. But rather, we should just simply preach the gospel. You know, if God has called us, we should preach the gospel, you know. And and that's how the church builds. When we have disciples, then now you need to have order. You know, now you need to have a way to, you know, to grow together, and then you need to appoint leaders. And one thing, you know, we've learned in these classes, that if you're really not planning churches, you're not a church. That's part of growth. People grow up and they go out and they, then they do the same. 
and what they've been grown up in. So if that's not happening, you know, you can you know expect that if the church has just been around for some a few years. Okay, we got Praise Tabernacle that's been around since 1970s. How many church plants are there? You know. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying, you know, we're st st stunted in our growth. You know, we need to now, and that's why we're doing these classes so I mean, we can. Don't you think, Pastor, that their focus was on missionary support as opposed to um, establishing brother and sister churches? Yeah. And you, know, and you know, some of the missionaries that are out there, um, per se, could probably be considered, you know, churches. They've preached the gospel, they've made disciples, and they're, you know, I'd have to evaluate all that to know for sure. But, so there, you know, there's some church, there's some people that have come out of here and have gone forward and have done doing a great work in a different place. And that's a good thing, you know, but there needs to be more of that. There needs to just not be just, you know, one, two, three, four. There needs to be all the church growing, everyone at some point being sent out. And again, it doesn't mean, always mean that you start a separate church from, I mean, it's all part of praise. You know, the discipleship groups could be considered a, a small church within the bigger church. Well, the article, when you've been reading it, it was talking about discipleship groups and cell groups mm -hmm. and how you become. And I think this was uh, years ago when uh, Pastor Steve asked us to be in the group uh, and consider it, and we did. And um, you are part of the church family, but your group is a small fellowship family that eventually it grows mm -hmm. spiritually um, by numbers also, but that you're able to communicate with the pastor or the elders what's going on within yeah. your own little family yeah. that brings the family. If each one of those groups would operate the way mm -hmm. the uh, article is stipulating and stating, uh, the church would be much closer, yeah. and I think the growth would uh, come much quicker. Yeah. But it's these people that have come out for these studies or these lessons that we've had, how many of them that I heard personally I don't want to be a deep group leader. I don't want to be a leader. Yeah. Then what do you take the class for? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leadership uh, at the time and most of us don't want to take the class at the time. Yeah. Because, it, you know, saying I'm a leader, that means you're going to look up to me, you know, uh, somebody to follow as we follow Christ, Amen. you know, and therefore your life is a, on a, you know, microscope now. So, um, yeah, so very few people are willing to step up, but it's needed, you know. It's really, really needed, and um, we need more discipleship going on. It depends where you come from, too, because, you know, a lot of times you <laughs> people know that they're called to leadership, but sometimes leaders make it seem like, you know, you have to be so educated and have a PPP, LLL, MMM, all these titles behind your name. And I know that was a thing for us, you know, afraid that you're never qualified. You hear, you know, people talking from the pulpit, you know, all these fancy words, and you're like, I even got to go get the dictionary to know what you're preaching about. Amen. You know, so you feel that you're not equipped. But when you really go to the Word, you know, no, and, and who called who called Paul? There was no bishop, no Jesus himself said, Okay, now you go and do what I told you to do. But that's not what's being taught. If if you know, if whoever so and so didn't say that you're not called who died and made you Jesus? You know what I mean? So that you know, it's not always that people don't want to, it's that People don't feel confident. People don't feel qualified. And it's, it's leadership that the leadership that's already established that makes you feel that way, my yes, sister. Absolutely. That they look down upon. Well, I don't know. I don't know if you're gifted enough. I don't know. You know can, did you read such and such? And how do you feel about where they don't even establish a dialogue with you to see what your gifts are, to see whether or not you truly have been called to be a leader. I think it's fear, too, that, you know, insecurities that people are going to leave and stuff. I, I really, really believe that because, you know, since I accepted the Lord, it was spoken into my life.
from when I first came to the Lord. But I know there's leadership that looked at me in the face and said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, oh, devil, you are a liar and a defeated foe. And the truth is not in you. Because a man does not call us. It's Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if you guys covered this or not, but another large problem with the church is leaders being able to recognize anointing. You know what I mean? I think that's that speaks to the individual. Um, I, I have guys covered. Are you actually saved? Are, 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 are leaders in the church really saved? Fill the Holy Spirit. You know, it's it's. I think there's evidence to speak that. You know, you could probably question. I mean, we don't know people's hearts, but you know, if you're anointed, if you're if you're, the person over you doesn't recognize that, there's a problem. You know what I mean? And it's not with you. It's like. It's like when people read the word and they read about sin or whatever and they have a problem with what the word says. It's not the problem. The problem's not with the word. It's with the individual. Mm -hmm. So we need to yeah, if you... train ourselves to recognize anointing, you know, to really examine our own hearts too. Well, I think it just, it, you know, to recognize it, it's in the spirit. Yeah. And we just have to choose to be people that are in the spirit. get in the spirit. Just stay in the spirit. The blind leading the blind. If they're not filled with the spirit, they can't. They're blind, so they can't recognize. Yeah, they're just walking people right into a, off the cliff. Whitewashed. Those early Christians were uneducated. Yeah, I was going to say that earlier. What they heard from Paul and the other disciples, and they followed that. <laughs> now we're so into everything. You can go on the internet and look up anything. Well, it's like Sister said, if I don't have a doctorate or a master's right. or whatever, I'm not qualified. Well, yeah. that, that's because we've become an organization. Yeah. And the organization has certain requirements. Mm -hmm. And the church has no requirement other than what? Being saved. You Being must saved. be born again. Born again. Mm -hmm. And you have all the riches of the kingdom. Yeah. But we've become an organization that says, and so you've got to have the alphabet soup behind your name <laughs> and if you don't have that nobody wants to hear it well it's just modern day Pharisees that's yeah. all it is yeah. and we'll Pharisee that starts with a B and we just have to choose for ourselves how, despite how things are is I'm going to be filled with the spirit I'm going to let the Lord lead me Amen. as long as the Lord leads me ain't nobody going to hold me back Amen. You know? in the midst of accountability and yeah, but I'm just saying the Lord is leading us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, He's not going to lead us to be rebellious and, and to be. I mean, yeah, He will lead us to be to rebel against the system of man. Exactly. But He's not going to rebel against the system of Him Himself. You know. We have to get to be like Paul, though. You know that Paul was not concerned, and one of the biggest things now, and I'm talking from what I've seen, is that people are more concerned about the number. Yeah, His kingdom. Right? If you don't have. And it's not even the concern, you know, are these people saved, Holy Ghost filled, and following Christ. It's how many people do you have in your church? That's why he took I have a church. time with them. How many people do you have in your church? That's what qualifies you. Are these people saved? The Word of God says, if you lift up the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God is going to draw them. Amen. All we got to do is be responsible to make sure that we give them Jesus. And that we give them the foundation of what this following Jesus is. The rest is up to Jesus. Yep. Um, so the, the reading this week was building a renewal strategy for the local church. So renewal, we're going to talk about renewal. Again, same thing with revivals and, you know, uh, reformation. It all kind of goes together. You know, renewal, the last major renewal that took place was the Toronto Blessing in the 90s. If you don't know about that, it was where the presence of God was poured out in a real tangible way and people from all over the world were going to Toronto to encounter God. And the Father Heart of God was the main message preached mm -hmm. and it spread everywhere all over the world and it was really a, again a reconnection with relationship with God was what it was all about. Um, there were some things that, you know, were questionable and all that, but every, every renewal and revival throughout history has always had that. Some questionable activities, because when, when non-perfect people <laughs> come together, there's going to be non-perfect things. It's going to be messy. 
but it, we, you know, there was a definitely great work of God taking place. Then it began over in um, in Florida at uh, no, no, before that, um, oh, Brownsville. Brownsville, Brownsville revival um, spread there and other places throughout the world. I think down in Argentina to um, so where are we at currently? Again, there was a, a, a bit of a, a similar renewal in Lakeland where people were coming from all over the world. Specifically, not for, as some people would say, Todd Bentley, but we who experienced it, the people were there for the presence of God, and the presence of God was poured out in a very powerful, tangible way. And it wasn't about just healings and all that. It was really about the presence of God. People were enjoying the worship, and, you know, Many people could feel, even watching on TV, you could feel the presence of God coming through the television. Yeah, it was totally tangible. Yeah, you can... You have to get... Yeah. Did anybody go to Lakeland? No? A lot of us went, with, you know. I took seniors, our senior kids, on a trip down there. It was their reward for graduating. Took them down to Lakeland and pretty cool time and it really wasn't it, the greatest time that we had was not in the building it was in our hotel room afterwards you know we had a, God showed up in a powerful way yeah yeah so it's really your heart that <laughs> opens yourself up to the presence of God doesn't matter where you're at you don't have to be in front of the great preacher you know or the great worship leader you know? <laughs> you have to be in front of the great God and God is everywhere so um so what is the current renewal? What I believe the current renewal is, is God restoring the kingdom of God. The understanding of the kingdom, and therefore, exactly what we're teaching about, bringing the proper order. Because is that, you know, where are we at when it comes to building his church? Okay, the, pre the gospel was preached. Well, we know the gospel has been preached. Okay. Then um, making disciples. That's been em being emphasized a lot over the last few years, too, is the importance of being a disciple. And then um, next is now raising up leaders and all that. Well, that all has taken place, but doing it the God's way, the kingdom way. Not the kingdoms of this world way, but the kingdom of God. And a lot of people have been building their own kingdoms and calling it church. So it's bringing all the revelation and, and you know, that has come forth, the truths that have been um, renewed throughout the history of the church and bringing it all together. You know, I just believe now is a time that everything is coming together as one. And so we're an exciting time because I would expect that would mean that Christ will follow because the church will be ready. You know, but the church that's divided and split apart, cut up in many pieces, who's Jesus coming to marry? Which pieces, you know, if the pieces are all broke up all over. So I think that the, the renewal that God's calling right now is the church to become one. And that might take some time. <laughs> this might be a long renewal, but I, you know, I, I see from what I hear. <laughs> so I, you know, the the revivals and the renewal renewals of the of yesterday year have very sh been short lasting. I believe this is going to be a long lasting thing that will continue until he returns. Amen. It will not be a two three year revival movement. And it will not be just this church-centered thing, a building-centered, a place-centered, but it will be all about us individually being renewed to Him and renewed to one another in our life, everyday experience. We will not be just seeing healings taking place in a, in a church building from a revivalist, but it will be part of our life. It will be a, it's a maturing renewal. It's a renewal that can only come to those, we can only walk in it if we're maturing in the Lord, you know, and in a mature place. So, um, that's what I, ex you know, see what God is doing currently. And, you know, I'm really excited about it. But there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, how many people are going to be willing to do things like this to get the knowledge, understand that they need to walk this out. So, in church development, we cannot copy someone else's experience and get the same results. Each situation, each person is unique alone. And a lot of these renewals in the past have been copying somebody. It's all about copy, you know, trying to be a, a carbon copy. You know, we're not, God, we're not to be carbon copies. God is uh, the originator. You know, we're to be originals. 
So, you know, we're not going to try to copy what God did in the past. It's what God is doing right now. We're not trying to copy somebody else. I'm not going to try to be like this person or that person. I'm going to try to be who God has made me to be. For us to be unified in one body, each person has to be their unique self and operate as their unique self. So therefore, we need our proper identity as individuals. So we can expect, you know, the, the prophetic movement to grow in this time. That people really in the local church, not just separate from the local church, but in the local church, really helping people have identity, speaking life to them, helping people discover who they are in Christ. History not learned is repeated. Okay, it's good to know history, but why? God wants to grow his kingdom. We need to know what has been established so it can be maintained. And we need to know what new revelation is being added so we can go ahead. Okay, so it's not just to neglect what happened yesterday, but just to know it so we know what God has done, so we can maintain what was of God, but yet see what wasn't of God, do away with what wasn't of God, keep what was of God, and, you know, this is exactly, you know, in a position like me, called to go into a church, apostolically, not plant a church, you know, you, you go into the church and you see what is of God, what should remain, and what might not be of God, and what should be removed. You know, same thing as if, you, if you're restoring a house. You know, do you have to knock it all down? Do you have to completely get rid of everything? Or is there some things that can't remain? Is there some structure that is strong enough or whatever? You know, I don't know. Good mm -hmm. So, um... And then, now, what is God saying now? What is God saying today? Can we move forward with that? Too often things are built, destroyed, built again, and destroyed. A repetitional cycle. Okay, all, again, all this is kind of stuff that came to me as I was reading the article. So too often things are built. The next generation comes and destroys it. Built it again with their new understanding. And then the next generation destroys that. It's not intergenerational. It's not interconnected. It's just a move that starts over again and over again and over again and over again, but doesn't build. So God wants to build. This is why Christ has not returned. The earth is not yet ready. He wants a progressive continuum. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. Maybe that's from my... Good job, buddy. Taking all these classes and stuff is helping me expand my... Way to use your big words. Yeah, progressive continuum. <laughs> rather than a repetitional cycle. So we've had this cycle just going back in circles. Basically like the children of Israel in, in, the, in the wilderness. You know, never getting to the promised land. You know, going so far, going back... Getting so far, going back. Yeah, Getting so far. Two, two steps forward, five back. Two yeah. forward, five back. So majority of us are part of something that started new and fresh, but wasn't something that was built on from what was before. You know, most denominations were that way. So they're just built on the present truth that was received, and that is it. Not from what was given before that, and then they stop with, they're not going to receive what comes afterwards. Professor? Yes. <laughs> it is? It is good. Yeah. I'm going to use that again. Progressive continuum. <laughs> this actually sounds very apostolic. Yeah, it does. It does. All right. I'm going to preach a message to call that. Yeah. It's a linear forward movement forever. I think so. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Say it nice and loud. What? Say that one again, the really? definition of it. Anything that goes through a gradual transition from one condition to a different condition without any abruption. Man, that's how the church is supposed to be. Yeah. That's good. I like that. So 10 keys to church growth. 10 keys. Doing the keys thing. Everybody teaches on the keys, but anyway. Ten keys to church growth. 
<laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay. Number one, begin with life. The church is primarily an organism, not a what? Organization. Okay, it's an organism, okay? We can learn, you know, how to have proper structure in place, but it cannot take away from life. It cannot kill the life of it. Life begets life. Focus on the people, which is the church, not the building. So that's the, the, the difficulty of having an organization is you get such structure in place that you forget about the individuals. You know, and... and, and and every organization is made up of individuals. So uh, the structure will not always work because each individual is so different. You remember when Jeff Beecham was here? He told you, he told all of us about the building. The building isn't the church. We could go outside, we could go in a tent, we could go on a ballpark, anywhere. That's where the church is because the church is the people. The church is not the physical structure. Yeah, yeah. The church is alive, it's got to be moving. If you just come, if, if your life as a Christian is coming to the building on a Sunday, that's not doing church because anything that, that's living has movement. So all of our structures, programs, everything has to be relationship oriented. Relationship with God and relationship with each other. And these things are just in place for opportunities to connect with God and connect with each other and grow together. Not just for accomplishing things and getting things done and... and you know, it's not about just providing a product and, you know, it's about people and God. Okay, number two, don't attack entrenched institutional patterns. Don't deal with institutionalism directly. Bypass it. People will choose what really works, and that will take care of the problem in of itself. Life <coughs> triumphs over death. Okay, if you get that, it's, it's pretty deep, you know, instead of just sitting and talking about how the church is so institutionalized and how bad it is and how off it is, we're wasting our time. Instead, you know, let's just be the organism. Let's be the life. Let's walk with, be the solution. Let's just be with Jesus and simply just do things that Jesus does and with him. And if there's life in it, People usually choose life, and there is life in it. If you really walk with Jesus, there's life. Yeah, if you have the... Step out of line, out of rebellion, and start this thing, and pull people to... to, to it's the wrong spirit. Them. Yeah. So there's no way the Spirit of God is going to be in that. You know, so, um, so with all the, you know, we've... In, in seeing how the church is, okay, we recognize it, now what? Yeah, fix it, you know? Yeah. I love people who come to me and they, they see a problem, and they don't just tell me about the problem, but they say how they can fix it, how, what they could do to help. You know, that's, that's real maturity. Um, number three, seek to pastor all the people. Pastoral care should be available to all despite differences. Okay, no, we're going to have people that were raised traditionally and they're going to have a hard time receiving anything different than what they've known. Did we just cast them off? No. Honestly, in the past, in my youth, that's probably how I would have, that's how I've responded. I just cast you off. You know, you're not with me. You're so different. You're so stuck in your old ways. Forget you. I'll find those who are not and roll with them, you know? The Bible says because there was a day we was at the same spot and Christ was patient with us. Yep. So. Yep. Those are the ones Jesus went after anyway. Yeah. Those are the ones he loved. The rejects. Well, yeah. You know, and Jesus still took time with the Pharisees even. And he still spoke to the Pharisees. He wasn't just, you know. Yeah. And some people are Pharisees, but it's just because that's all they've known. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and unconditional love breaks walls down over time. It might be difficult at first because, again, we know tradition nullifies the word. But our life, the living word, being lived out before people unconditionally anyway over time can begin to change perspectives. Pastor Josh, you sometimes feel that people, they don't even understand the definition of unconditional because 
without really thinking about it or realizing it when they open their mouth at times. I love you if. Yeah. I love you when. Yeah. You know, and that's not Jesus. Jesus yeah. loves us unconditionally mm -hmm. with additional grace and mercy as needed. Yeah. Unmerited grace and mercy. But I think our society today, we see it in so many, what, I don't care what the age group is, you see conditions mm -hmm. put on every part of your life. Yeah. If you get a new car, uh, you know, well, should I get a new car? That's, you know, conditions. I have to stay up with him. That's, that's not the way God wanted us to yeah. be with each other. That's just my opinion, my humble opinion. I was asked, uh, Jonathan's not able to speak to the youth today, so I asked the Lord, you know, what would he like to say to the Lord? And he just told me, um, I mean, what would the Lord like to say to the youth? said, uh, just tell him about my unconditional love. Amen. You know? And a lot of people, they just simply don't know, like she was saying about unconditional love, they don't know about love, period. Yesterday I was tattooing a kid, and I have him sit there in my chair, so I have him for hours. So I was ministering to him, and I'm like, I was just asking him, you know, what do you think about love? And he's just like, and he, he's a young kid, and he got, he got moved up in life really quick, making big money. So he just, he's just like, I, I don't know. Like, he doesn't think about love. I'm like, is there anybody you love unconditionally? Mm -hmm. And he was like, not really. So I'm like, how you live in life? Then I asked him, he grew up in the Catholic Church, you know, CCD, weekly classes and all that. He was like, you know what the church is? basically based around and feel like no i like i'll just like christ's love for us mm. i like and that's what love is it doesn't it doesn't have any conditions mm. and the fact that and the problem was he just he was just didn't know mm. so he never had a really chance to come to christ because he doesn't understand and if we don't share not even with the people in the church yeah. then we're not doing our job not sharing. We are held accountable for not sharing. And then, you know, you come back to the old cliche, ignorance is bliss. Yeah, yeah. So people, rather than admit that they don't know, like in this case with this young man, he was bold enough to tell you, I don't know. Mm. But there will, there will be people that will go around the bush. You, you would be asking a general question and you want an answer. You're, you're seeking, you're, you're witnessing to that individual. Yeah. And you're trying to give them the love of Christ that's in you, showing them the light. And in the interim, they could BS you. They could, you know, oh yeah, I know, you know. But you would feel it. Your mm -hmm. spirit would connect with theirs, knowing that he's just telling me this, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> I don't know if I should say that, but... You know, the majority of church leaders do have, a, you know, a couple letters behind their title. And that is, you know, instead of a BA, it is a BS. Uh-huh. But anyway. I said a tendency to pass. <laughs> Go ahead, Apostle Kennedy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah whatever sells. Unfortunately, yeah. Jesus is in for sale. That's right. So uh, number three on our keys to church growth is uh, seek to pastor all the people. Okay, we said that. Um, do not neglect those whom God has entrusted in your care, though they are difficult. Win them with love. It's the best way to deal with traditional people. Uh, number four, build a balance of worship, community, and witness. Are we providing believers with the opportunities and the structures for these key aspects of their life together? A balance of worship, community, and witness. So are people being raised up in, with proper balance? Because again, if you don't have balance, you have extreme. And extreme takes you too far. If you go too far, you fall. So um, we need worship. We need to have a strong community. Relationships are being built together. And we need to be going out and witnessing. Okay, number five is provide small groups and home meetings. That was number four. That was four. Yeah, number five is provide small groups and home meetings. Again, disciples need opportunity for commitment to others to grow. The importance of a small group is that you can be committed to people, committed to one another. Therefore, there's accountability in place. 
So if you're just part of a huge group of people, you get lost in it. You become a number. Yeah, just a number. Oh, yep, I have 450 people at our church. Ain't nobody connected to nobody. Nobody's a disciple. Yeah, 10 people are really saved. That's it. But the crowd keeps coming. Jesus got lots of crowds. People wanted to be healed. People wanted to be delivered. But only a few wanted to be disciples. So it's really the disciples that mean anything. Number six, affirm the ministry of all believers. All believers are called and should be equipped and empowered for ministry. All believers are called and should be equipped. Every single one. Okay, does anybody, uh, you know, have kids and they say, you know what? These two, I hope, grow up. Yeah, you, know, you two can just, just stay babies forever. You know, <laughs> just stay at home. You know, I'll baby you and the other two, you know. When you're a good parent, you want all your kids to grow up in the right way and get out and well, move on. Two things. You give them roots and you give them wings. Roots and wings is good. Yep. So, uh, you know, a, a good leader, a good leader wants all to grow and is only satisfied when everyone is doing well. Yeah, but if they don't grow, then there's something wrong. There's some type of handicap. So leadership's main responsibility should always be, and should always be evaluating themselves every year, are the people that we're responsible for growing? And if not, what are we going to do about it? That should be the, the yearly meeting the elders have. There should be always an evaluation of growth. Has there been growth this year? Not in numbers, but in character. Now with character, usually we'll bring numbers, because people will be drawn. Because again, you become leaders. When you have character, you become automatically a leader because people will look up to you. And as long as you are now have character and now therefore a leader, automatic, without the title or anything, people are being drawn to Christ through your life. And therefore, numbers are growing. Because that's just the way it is. Life begets life. So move toward the biblical model of leadership. Okay, six was affirm the ministry of all believers. Seven is moving towards the biblical model of leadership. Three essentials. Leadership based on scriptural qualifications of character and giftedness. So again, it's not just gift. It is character. There is a gift of leader. But you don't just step into that until you have the character to go along with it. The gifting will be there, though. And so it could, somebody could appoint you into a position just because of the gift, but that would be unwise. You know, a wise leader looks for both of those before they put somebody in a, in a place of leadership. Amen. It's character and gift. Also, because uh, I know this was, we discussed this last week, second, this individual, I'm quoting him, I learned how important it is to have women as well as men to pastoral leadership, move up to pastoral leadership. There's a lot of churches that refuse to have women step into the pulpit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If that person has been anointed and appointed and they're spiritually filled, yeah. who are you as the pastor? I know you're the shepherd and you're the anointed one of mm -hmm. that particular structure. But who are you to keep that person out of there because of the gender? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah again, in the spirit, all these walls should be down. You know, we sh there's no black and white. There's no Jew and Gentile. There's no male and female. There is God embodied in man. Amen. And that means male and female. Amen. And however God wants to use somebody, who are we to say no? God, I don't think so. It, it, things don't happen. This culture, it don't happen that way. God doesn't use women. <laughs> who are you? You know, what, you know. <laughs> then I, you know, I would expect when you have that kind of mentality, then you need to go through Job experience for God to reveal to you who he is and how great he is and who are you to be able to say what's what you know and you say, basically set yourself up say okay I guess I'm going to allow Satan to strip you of everything so you can figure out how much you are, how, yeah, who you, are. you are to me and how are you teaching what I want I'd, I'd rather not go through Job experience if I don't have to I would rather not have my, my, my kids die you know, and go through all sickness and disease and, and lose my home and everything and have my, my friends belittling me and all that. I mean, who wants to go through that? But that's what, that's what you're setting yourself up when you have that kind of I'm God mentality. I know what, you know. 
who really do not know the scriptures, they may dabble in it, but they don't know it, and they don't know what, just take Job, the book of Job, for instance, when you're discussing all the different uh, occurrences that happen. And I know I did a study on it a few years ago with another pastor, and it was unbelievable what he drew out of that to each student mm -hmm. that made you really analyze your life. Yeah. You know, because we're not perfect, but we can become perfect in Christ. That's why it's important, you know, to when you lead somebody to the Lord, to get them filled with the Holy Spirit as soon as possible. Because, again, until you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you read and study the Word, you're limited. You can't walk this walk without the Holy Spirit. And you're trying to figure out the Word of God without being filled with the Spirit. Therefore, you got a battle going on of, of tradition and, 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 and your own upbringing and everything. But when you fill with the Spirit, just it opens up. Amen. Puts, puts off all those things. And, and it's just common sense. The Bible is just so common sense. There's not a lot of debating in your mind. It just makes sense in the Spirit. Yeah. All these arguments amongst one another don't make any sense. It's just flesh. You know, our own... Interpretation, too. Yeah, intellect, you know. Intellect. Which our intellect is, is, as Paul said, his intellect was as mere dung compared to God. You know? even though he was one of the most intellectual t people of his time. Um, number eight, help. Oh, did I skip some of the stuff? Okay, uh, number seven, also pastoral leadership defined primarily as equipping for ministry and team for plural leadership in each congregation. Okay, so <laughs> pastoral leadership is the, yeah, defined primarily as equipping, working as a team, Plural rather than an individual thing. Ministry grows out of community and leadership grows out of discipleship. Ministry grows out of community and leadership grows out of discipleship. Biblical model leadership. Okay, number eight. Help the congregation discover its own identity. A congregation finds its identity as it ministers, grows, and discover, discovers its gifts. And that's again another importance of having a small group. How do you discover that when you're amongst a group of, you know, how, how many people can step out in their gifting if there's hundreds of people? You know, a uh, small group allows each individual to have an opportunity to step out. But this process can be made more intentional and self-conscious through teaching and preaching in many different forms, missions, small groups, retreats, community service. So you need to have in place opportunities for people to find their identity. And that usually goes from being challenged, you know, from being put in a position where you have to step out. Because when you step out, you step into something. You know, you step, when you step out in faith, you step into God's grace. And when God's grace comes the package of his anointing, his, his giftings upon your life. So if, everybody, if you just sit around and just absorb anything, everything, you have no clue what your potential is. Mission trips are one of the greatest Opportunity, small, you know, small mission trips because you're challenged in all kinds of ways and you have nothing else to do but respond. And then you say, oh, wow, I didn't know I knew that. The Spirit brings all truth when it's necessary. But just sitting around thinking about what do I know? What do I know? What does the Bible say? What scriptures have I memorized? Blah, blah, blah. You don't know <laughs> that much. It's when you step out. You step in, you receive, and you're like, oh my goodness. Oh, it's not about what I know, it's about what God knows. Amen. And when it's needed, it's there. God provides. Because you're the vessel. Yeah, just a vessel. So, a lot, yeah, a lot of reasons people don't have much of identity, don't have, you know, are not confident, because they don't even know the potential of the living Christ inside of them. Number nine, work to ensure that financial stewardship authentically reflects the church's mission and self-identity. This was a big part of what I was learning this week in my um, course on nonprofits. It was all kinds of stewardship, but financial is a big part. Does the money being spent go along with the mission of the organization, or for us, you know, the mission of Christ? One's use of money shows their priorities. Money should follow mission. Have clear defined mission so money will not be wasted on non-essentials, which is un unethical. 
So it was actually unethical for, for any organization, non or for profit, to use their resources for th primarily for things that are not along with their mission. It's an, an actually an unethical practice. So we're, you know, an, an ethical organization if what we're doing goes along with God's mission. What is God's mission? You know, to save the lost. You know, build his kingdom. To make disciples. Disciple the nations. You know, what is our clear mission here at Praise Tabernacle? People restored and inspired serving everywhere. Have, making sure people are being restored, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, and going out and serving everywhere. So our money spending should go along with our mission. Or we're not, we're unethical. Money should be used outwardly, kingdom-minded, rather than inwardly, church-centered. Okay, God's all about growing his kingdom, expanding his kingdom. So if it's all about, you know, we're going to take up an offering because I feel the Lord leading me to have a, this new church building. We need five million dollars. We're going to have the best <laughs> church building around. And, and it, Boy, it's going to look good. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be the best looking church around here. <laughs> we're going to have a big water fountain up front. We're going to have a, we're going to have a Starbucks inside. Why Dude, stop, stop describing short fellowship. Seriously, why, why it's not stop, cool. Why stop there, Pastor? Oh. Why, why don't you start building? And, and you know, keep the community together that way. Yeah. This way you control. Control that. everybody. Yep. Do the. You can, you can edit that right out, right, Bill? Yeah. We'll have our own everything. <laughs> edit that part out. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever Ed's going to be here, we got to make sure we edit. Um. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. Good stewards. That's where churches go wrong. You know, I'm glad that the government is, is doing what they're doing. You know, they're probably going to take it too far because they're, you know, the devil's probably using them also. But, but um, you know, there needs to be, a, you know, there needs to be accountability to churches. There needs to be accountability to nonprofits, even grassroots. I mean, even um, tea parties. There needs to be authentic because there's a lot of abuse. Yeah. You know, they're taking it too far, most likely. But that's what always happens. There's a over here, over here, over here. Yeah, but we cannot continue to get away with just using money however we want, you know. And it's totally against the mission it's for somebody to get fat and large off other people. That's pretty common today. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very common in the American well. church. Yeah, and the way it's well. the church. That's the sad part. And we gotta, we gotta remember we're not. That's why. That's the reason why. It doesn't happen like in Paul's day. He's set up here, he's moving, he's set up here, he's moving. Everywhere there's a little setup because one person cannot oversee. It's like I have six kids. I could not do it without him. It's just too many of them. There's only six. <laughs> so how could you possibly run a ministry with thousands and thousands of, and thousands? You know, every group of people has a different need or whatever. But it's easy to get lost in you know, the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go to a large church to get lost. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now that these large churches have a big staff, but they don't have a big amount of leaders. Right. Well, that's true, Pastor Josh. Uh, my husband's uh, sister, her husband uh, became very ill, and they belong to a very large church. I know she used to say, oh, it's a wonderful church, until her husband became ill. And this particular pastor had 32 deacons, ordained deacons, so each one had a section of that church. Mm -hmm. And while her husband was hospitalized, all she wanted was for one of those deacons, or even the pastor, to take the time to come to the church, uh, excuse me, the hospital, pray with him, give him communion, whatever. And in, through prayer and through seeing what was done and not done, she decided before he passed away that that church was not the church for them and they should, they should move on because they became a number. Mm -hmm. They weren't who they, you know, they weren't the brother and the sister in Christ. They were a number. Mm -hmm. And when you have this uh, man or woman, leader, with 32 underlings that are supposed to be taking care of responsibilities and they're not doing their job, where's the failure? Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it trickles down to the congregation. Mm -hmm. Yep, because, it, it, you know, 
we need to think like a team again. I'm not, okay, let's take our, um, our little basketball team that we had. They're going on. In the beginning, you know, we were getting, even though some players have some talent and all, but the teams we're playing against, you know, play together all the time. They know how to play with each other, so they were victorious and they were killing us because we just did know each other well enough. So we were we weren't doing well. You know, you got to first put together a team and then work together as a team, and then things will go well. Most churches start with a man who preaches well, and people like to listen to him. So, and it spreads and it grows, and more and more people like to listen to him. Now you got such a big group of people when they listen to a person, and what now? What are you going to do? Now, you know, now you have to put people in position, but you haven't really spent the time with the, individual. with the individuals to see what their character is like. So you don't know, you see, now you only see their gifting. So now you have to put them in place because there's a, such a demand. So they're put there and put here, but you don't even know how to work together. And you don't even have the time now to spend to, to grow that dynamic. A lot of times they put them because of, a, let's say, a talent or skill. Yeah, because talent, skill, skill, gift. Just because you speak well in front of people. No. No. So the first thing, you know, you should get a small group of people and you should pour into them and, 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 and as a character develops, others will automatically draw to them. And so you're growing as a because of the team rather than the individual. And then that team is doing the same with those few people that they're leading and it's growing multiplication, but everybody is connected to each other and there's gifting and character in place, then it's healthy. Then you can grow however big. But even as you grow big, people are going to be sent out and start things different where. It's not going to be all centered in one place, one location. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this the way of church, this uh, the, the huge churches with great leaders, great speakers, the that's not... Church. Yeah, the mega church thing is not the kingdom. It's not the kingdom. <laughs> the last one, um, help. Number 10, help. The church catch a kingdom vision. What God is doing and what... What is God doing and what has he promised to do? This is a vision for community and worship, but also a vision for reconciling ministry in the world in which evangelism, discipling, and justice are inseparable strands in the fabrics of ministry. God's kingdom is to fill every sphere of society for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have to give people a kingdom vision. Not a church-centered vision where it's a social club. And we're basically here to be comfortable and to just know each other and have, you know, have, you know, have friends. Uh, I need some place to build some friends, you know? That's what it's all about. Just having picnics and, 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 and banquets and, you know, things to build our friendship. Okay, it's more to it than that. It's about what is God doing in this community? What does he want to do? Where is, where is injustice? God is a God of justice. He wants to bring justice and righteousness. You know? What is, how does he want to use us to bring forth his kingdom in this entire territory? So we should have a bigger vision than just hanging out in church and eating food together. You know, that's all part of fellowship. But there's much more to the kingdom than just that. You know, God wants to, to work through us and, and to change the world around us and not just get fat on it, you know, with each other. I just to build a relationship so that we can play well together when we get on the court. Mm -hmm. not yeah. <laughs> it's to win and spread, you know. Victory. So look at, um, real quick, last thing I wanted to see was God wants to deinstitutionalize de the church. How many more minutes do we have? We're running out of time. Turn to page 512 and 513. In for those who have it, oh, yeah. 512 and 513. Oh, never mind. I think it's 312 and 313. Yeah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's actually stuck with 311, I believe. Yeah. Special problems of institutionalization. Yeah, I guess that was it. Okay, sorry. Okay, real quick, if we run out of time, so be it. But here we go. Institutionalism is, in its various forms is often a fundamental obstacle to renewal and has been throughout history. 
It was largely the institutional barriers to renewal efforts that provoked Philip Spinner to call for reform in, of his writing in 1675. To avoid unnecessary frustrations, we must be realistic about institutionalism. At this point, the church is much like any other social institution. Institutions resist change and therefore renewal. Okay, the greatest fight usually with change, renewal is within our own. It's not with the enemy out there, it's the enemy within. Amen. Why is this? There are at least seven reasons. First, an institution is structured for continuity, stability, and, and routinization, and against the unpredictable. Second, institutions partake of human fallenness. An institution may not be inherently evil, but can become the repos repository and tool of human evil. Third, institutions rely on technique, not grace. Grace is uncontrollable and forgiving, while technique is always consistent. The same thing's done the same way. Fourth, an institution exists as an objective structure to which people must conform. It conforms people to itself, not vice versa. Fifth, institutions become repositories of vested interests, providing power and security not easily given up for those who wield institutional power. That could be underlined. Fifth, institutions become, let me say that again, repos repositories of vested interests, providing power and security not easily given up for those who wield institutional power. Six, institutions divide people up according to institutional power and status. <laughs> Generally, institutions make it very clear just where everyone fits, what your place is, and how it compares to those above or below. Finally, institutions tend to create their own mythology and morality. They define reality in their terms. Right becomes, by definition, what the institution wants, and evil is to oppose the institution. This is true of all institutions, but it becomes especially invidious in religious institutions, which takes on the aura of the sacred. As Gilbert James used to say, any institution may become demonic, and especially the church institution. Amen. This is deep stuff. But there are effective ways to work for institutional renewal. Some of these suggested above, and some hints were given in the previous chapter. I would add here, however, by way of summary and extension, the following clues in working for institutional renewal. Number one, don't attack head on. That produces reaction, strife, and the institutional discrediting of the renewal effort. That's happened a lot through renewal periods in history. Number two, recognize that inevitability. Yeah, inevitability. I knew I'd get that one of word. Those. That word. And positive value of the institution. Institutions are functional, or they would not exist. Recognize the legitimate functions they fulfill. Okay, the church is still alive and breathing, maybe barely in some parts, but the institution has, you know, the there is a, a church in the world. It just needs some cleaning out. Number three, an institutional renewal begin with life, not with organization or organizational tinkering. The points made previously in the discussion of renewal strategies apply here. Again, life begets life. Number four, make community context for renewal. Seek to create a sense of community or sub-community within the institution using structures. You know, how can you bring change? Start with your D group. Start with your little group of discipleship. Do things according to the way God said to do it. Start there and let it spread. Let it grow from there because life will spread. Number five, transfer institutional functions to community functions wherever possible. Do informally or in community what has been overly formalized or institutionalized. People are very confused about church, about God, because of institution. Well, let's begin to change that, one person at a time. Let's show them something different. They might have a lot of questions, they might have a lot of walls up because of what they've seen, what they've experienced in the past. Well, with unconditional love shown over and over again, again, it breaks down the walls. Number six, work to create structures based on community and consensus rather than on hierarchy and delegated authority. In other words, work to change the model. Amen. So we got to change the model, first of all, ourselves, the small group of people around us, our family, whoever we got, and we begin changing the whole from the cell that we are. You know, the life that we are will begin. Life is above death. And wherever there's death in the church, we will change it by just being life. 
So it seems overwhelming if you look at the entire church and the structure that is current and what things need to be done to change that. And most people, when things seem overwhelming, what do they do? Just give up. They say, forget about it. So let's stop looking at it that way. Let's just look at our own self and the small group of people that we have in our life and begin changing there. You know, making sure that we're not going the same way. Amen? amen. And amen. amen. And that is the end of this lesson.